Hello, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Andrew Berry. Uh, I'm a senior architect at Lullabot, and today we're going to be talking about some of the uh, lessons I have learned in web and project management. Uh, and this talk is going to be telling everything in the form of a fable, so I think uh, it'll at least be entertaining, if not uh, exciting for some of you. So. Uh, just to sort of tell you where I'm coming from and uh, my background knowledge, uh, I started with Drupal working at a university making minimum wage. Like seriously, can you believe that? Minimum wage, it's pretty crazy. Um, but I actually lucked out in that when I started this job, uh, I inherited a really awesome website. Uh, it was built with HTML and clean CSS and uh, very minimal use of JavaScript because uh, they actually cared about accessibility and so on. Uh, and there was no CMS. It was all built with server-side includes, which, you know, at the time, this was before I knew anything about Drupal, seemed pretty good. Uh, you know, whenever I needed to update the main menu, it wasn't that bad. Um, so I did this for a few months, and uh, then I discovered something pretty awful. The person who built the site previous to me forgot to put a server-side include for the footer. And we changed our phone number. And then I had to update like 300 HTML files on disk to change a phone number. Uh, so when that happened, I, I basically realized, man, this is, this is brutal. We need a content management system, or at least something that I can use with decent templating to keep everything together. Um, so I found my way to Drupal, and I've been using it ever since. Uh, and part of the reason I stuck with Drupal is that I came out to conferences like these and other people previous to me got up on these stages and uh, shared their experiences and talked about what they had learned. And uh, I really want to be able to do some of that with the rest of the community. So uh, I'm really excited to have everyone here today and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, getting to interact with you. So uh, as developers and project managers and architects, it's really easy to forget the lessons that we've learned after building tens or hundreds of websites. Uh, and it's even easier to forget to share these lessons we've learned with our team and with the industry that we uh, live within. Uh, because we're always moving on to the next site to build. We don't really have downtime in our work, and that's really uh, a tough thing for us to deal with. Um, Apollonius of Tyana, who is a Greek philosopher, uh, he was right on when he said that simple, clear stories were great for teaching. Uh, sometimes the most obvious lessons that we learn uh, or are those that are actually the most important as well. Uh, it's when we sort of look back and we realize what journey it took for us to learn that lesson uh, that we can realize it's something worth communicating with our teams. Uh, when we learn the truth of something and we distill it down and we share it with our teams, uh, it's an act of self-reinforcement for our survival in this industry. And it's sort of a checksum for our learning and it's really important. Um, now, we have all of these lessons from antiquity, which we call fables today. And while we live in a really different world, uh, it doesn't mean that the lessons that they're trying to teach are antiquated. Uh, so for anyone here who's a beginner who just learned about Drupal like two days ago and is like, ah, what's a node? What's a content type? I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, don't worry. I make all these mistakes all the time, and you will too, and it's probably OK. Um, and sort of along the same vein, for those of you who have been around since like hook help was introduced in Drupal core, you know. I gotta say, like, why do we keep making these mistakes over and over again? Like, someone in the audience is gonna be look, working with me on some future project, and I say, Andrew, you stood up at Montreal and you talked about this, and you should know this. Why are you doing it? And I'll probably say, but it was shiny. Uh, so you get an idea of which fable will probably apply most to me. Um, so let's start. Once upon a time, there was a dog who had found a bone on the ground. As the dog was crossing a river, he looked down and he saw the reflection of the bone in the water. He opened his mouth to get the other bone and he lost the bone in the river. Fast forward a thousand years or perhaps not so long ago, there was an inexperienced and enthusiastic webmaster learning about Drupal. In fact, just weeks before, the gung-ho webmaster had been building websites with HTML, uploading them with FTP, uh, and for their clients who were really into being online, they had dedicated Facebook pages. 
Uh, a news story mentioned Drupal, and it was being used by their local university to replace a mishmash of WordPress and Perl scripts from the 1990s. So the webmaster did some research, and they realized they were stumbling into a whole new world. Uh, now, this person, they were really new to content management systems in general. They'd thought they had a pretty good idea of how things worked online. Um, but as they started to read more and more, they realized that the borders of their world were starting to be pushed further out. They were learning that with Drupal, we get content types so that we can separate our biographies from our photos uh, instead of putting them all into one just generic blog post field. Uh, of course, we get fields as well, which allow us to uh, add specific functionality to a content type. So maybe in a biography, we have a field for the person's photo and a date for when they join the company. Uh, you could set up your meeting content type so that the agenda upload field was required and you're not looking back six months wondering why you have a meeting with no agenda. Uh, and of course with Drupal we get create and edit forms, uh, we get user accounts and we get code that has been audited by hundreds or thousands of people. Uh, you're getting a lot sort of for free in this default download that for those of us who have been in the Drupal community for a while forget that you don't get with you know, HTML and CSS and JavaScript. Um, and in fact, with Drupal, we're getting much of the functionality of the big hosted solutions as well, um, but you're not being forced to promote Facebook or Google along the way. It allows your marketing and your company to define its own de destiny. So uh, yeah, you can see I've kind of drunk the Drupal Kool-Aid a bit. So to get back uh, to this webmaster, learning all of this was just a huge shift in their world. It was like upgrading from a feature phone to a smartphone. Um, and as they read more and more, they saw the borders going further and further out. Uh, and they realized that the world online wasn't just twice the size or 10 times the size of what they knew. In fact, all they knew was just a small, tiny, insignificant dot in this universe of possibilities. Uh, of course, they're learning with Drupal that we get a library of modules that you can go to download and extend uh, what you're getting out of the box. And this is really kind of different than other systems out there. Like, modules aren't like Ruby gems or PHP extensions or node packages in that they usually have a user interface and you can do something without, with them without having to learn to code. Um, so it's really enabling for those who either don't have the skills or just don't like to do coding in the first place. Uh, and as this webmaster was building out uh, test sites and seeing how all this work, they were realizing that it wasn't just about choosing single modules by themselves to build a site. Uh, it was about combining them in unique and interesting ways to create a business value that their clients couldn't replicate with other systems. And it was impossible for them to replicate with their old methods of HTML and CSS and so on. So, enough reading. We've all been at this point. Screw that. Time to start building. All right. So what comes first? Every business website needs an event and needs a calendar. So of course with Drupal, we've got a date and calendar modules to help us set that up. So the webmaster's clicking around and installing all this stuff on their site. And as the calendar was being built, the, the company's CFO saw a list of popular events on another site. Hey, can we do that too? Sure, said the webmaster, Drupal can do that. There's a module for that. Uh, now, this sounds like a great feature. We can encourage people to show up to our meetings. We can show that there's interest in what we're doing in the community. It's win, win, win. No lose in that picture at all. Um, so, you know, a week later, the webmaster has made really good progress. Uh, events are in place on the website, and the radioactivity module is almost working. But, of course, they changed what they were doing, and they attached radioactivity to blog posts because they kind of took a step back and realized that hot events really doesn't make any sense. Um, but then the webmaster saw a post on the Drupal planet about the flex slider module. So flex slider is a module which lets you create carousels for your website. Hey, this is amazing, said the webmaster. I've always wondered how to do this. See, I, people in the audience, you know what I'm talking about. I'm sure there's some of us who are, yeah, exactly. Um, and so the webmaster started building a photo content type, and they added image fields, and they built out a basic list of photos. And uh, they were about to start debugging their carousel on their iPad because it was totally broken when 
The webmaster's manager started going to Drupal meetups to see what this Drupal thing was about, and they said, hey, have you heard about the message module? This thing's amazing, said the webmaster. There's a module for that. Now we can set it up so people get emails from our events when they're about to, ready to start, so they actually show up. Um, it sounds really great. Let's get started on it. But of course, the webmaster never really got the carousel working on iPads and popularity sorting on blog posts. It was really kind of by a random order and didn't make much sense to anyone. So before long, the webmaster had been jumping from idea to idea for months on end. And they had ended up with a site that had a view for every day, a content type for every week, and of course, comments on all the things. But when it comes down to it, this webmaster, for all they had learned and all they had built and all they were excited about, they didn't have anything done. And that's because they had dropped the feature for its reflection. They would realized that the biggest lesson they were learning wasn't about content types and how to use them right, or what module was best for what functionality, or even more important, the, the holy war between underscores and dashes. It wasn't about PHP modules or memory limits or the horrors of mod, broken mod rewrite rules. They were learning that the biggest lesson was that with Drupal, it was really easy to get to the 90%. It's hard to get that last bit done, but to get something mostly in place, oh yeah, you're on board for that. And that's because they were also realizing that webmasters and developers they get bored with what they know, and they get bored with what's easy and repeatable. Once you know how to do something, what's the point in doing it? You might as well go on to something new. As technologists, we like to use the new shiny, and we just can't get away from that. Now, there's, you know, this is something that applies to pretty much all of the tech industry, but you know, one of the, the cultural mantras we have in Drupal as well uh, is, of course, there's a module for that. And when it comes down to it, modules really are at the foundation of Drupal's culture. Uh, you know, Lullabot has the Module Monday series, which we blog uh, under. There's buildamodule.com, there's Modules Unraveled. Modules are what makes Drupal work. Uh, and it's not just a mantra that we follow, it's something that we can't even really fight or stop. Because eventually, as site builders uh, get experienced with Drupal and realize that learning a bit of PHP sounds like a pretty good idea, they transition to the other part of our culture, which is, I can write a module for that. But that lesson, we're, we're missing sort of the big part of what actually makes successful products, in that as site builders and developers, we have to be disciplined. We have to fight the urge to use modules in place of decisions and analysis. We have to find a path and we have to commit to it. And we have to actively evaluate the results before we move on. Some of us in this room are hopefully clients and it's really important that we try to hold our expectations in line uh, with reality. If we're constantly changing priorities, whether it's for technological or business reasons, we're doing exactly the same thing that we ask our developers to not do. And there's hopefully some project managers in here, even if you're gonna shy away and not actually say you're a project manager, that's okay. Um, because you know, project managers though, we have to balance the tension from both sides between our clients and our technology teams. We can't let our developers shift technology direction from underneath us. And we have to hold the line with our clients who can't keep their priorities in order for a reasonable period of time. Our gung-ho webmaster had learned that we have to make sure that before we start to implement or add a module, that we aren't just letting our excitement get the better of ourselves. We have to be sure that what we're adding actually fits in and brings value to our clients. We have to be willing to slow down and wait. We have to have enough focus to bake the feature we've caught and not drop it in the stream to pursue what's next. The end. All right, so I learned something telling that story. Every time I do, it's a, a lot of fun and uh, I just get new insights and so on. And hopefully some of you picked up one or two lessons there. But uh, I think we're, we're done with that and it's uh, time to move on to our next fable. Once upon a time, there was a group of travelers stopping at a village for the night. All they had on them was a pot 
and they were broke and they had no food. So they go to a stream and they fill the pot with water and they place a stone inside and they start a fire. As villagers come by to see what's going on, the travelers say, we're making stone soup and it's really good, but it just needs some garnish to finish it off. Sure, said the villager, I have some extra carrots and they get added to the soup and as more and more villagers come by each time they're asked for a little bit more garnish. And eventually there's a complete soup ready to be enjoyed by all. So uh, let's fast forward 600 years and you know, once upon a time, but sometime last year, there was a project manager who was in charge of a company site redesign. And uh, like many projects, it kicked off with the development team being super excited with like a ridiculous number of exclamation marks and ones mixed in with one another. But pretty soon, it seemed to derail into something that had lost much of the original passion. After all, it's hard to work for your company website and keep that momentum moving when you're also competing against client work and other projects that require brand new technology. So what's a project manager to do? After all, they, they can't build the site themselves. It's too much work for one person. Sure, this project manager had read using Drupal and they were just realizing that it wasn't realistic for them to do everything. But luckily, they still had a few tools for them to get things back on track. The project manager had their favorite tool of all. They had the ticket. Now, it was time to build up a bit of excitement. So what's the first step? Well, in many ways, it's the hardest one, it was wait for someone to show a little bit of interest. After all, if you don't have top-down direction to force something to happen, you have to wait for it to bubble up from the bottom. And in this case, the project manager was a bit pleasantly surprised as it was easier than they expected um, because you see their current website, it wasn't mobile friendly at all. So a new front-end dev who was just hired by the company said, what's up with this? How can we possibly not have a mobile website? or at least one that doesn't cause my iPhone to cry. Well, said the project manager, we're making a great website. It's going to have fresh content and it's going to be responsive and it's going to be something we can all be proud of. We do need to add a bit of CSS garnish to tie it all together. Can you spare an hour to knock out this ticket? We don't have proper hover states on our menus and it's totally broken on touch. Hey, you can, great. I'll be glad to review the changes when they're ready. As that dev was working, they posted a screenshot online of the new primary menu navigation, and it was looking really good. Uh, others realized that the new primary sections were vastly improved over the old content structure, but they weren't perfect. So the company's content nerd took a look and realized that having blog on the left followed by a home link didn't really make much sense. So they filed a ticket. No good project manager is going to ignore someone else's interest. Hey, can you help season up our content model a little? You've got the skills and it would make our amazing website even better. Soon more of the business was noticing the work. Developers started to look around after hearing all of the good things on the new site. Surely it can't be that far along. So they clicked around and they tried to throw in some cross-site scripting because everyone likes getting random alert boxes when they're testing a site. Um, and actually, the site was looking pretty good. Hey, can we launch this? This thing's awesome. Well, the project manager said, can you double check our search settings? Let's make sure everything's in tip-top shape before we launch. So the uh, architect took a look and said, what's this? I, I, am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? That's Drupal's built-in search module powering our search results. Why do we have this set up? It's a recipe for destruction on a site with as much traffic as ours. Of course, our knowing project manager said, you're right, but we're really close to launch. Maybe you could grind in some solar. Can I assign you the ticket? Well, we can all see where it goes from here because pretty soon they had a real website one that was complete enough for everyone to enjoy. But who was responsible for rescuing this project? Of course, it was the project manager, the protagonist of the story. If you're like me though, you're, you're hearing me tell this and you're sort of thinking, this, this isn't right, this feels a little bit off. Why is that? Well, it's because in our industry, it's all too easy to put all of the negative responsibility on a project manager. The truth is, 
we give project managers a ridiculously hard time in our industry. Why is that? I mean, we always have project managers, you know, sometimes we're even asking for them, but even then we still feel like they're not contributing sometimes. And I think as technologists, it's because we have trouble defining what a project manager actually does. A project manager's work is ephemeral. Their work is about creating the conditions and the environment for effective collaboration. And uh, developers and site builders, especially in the Drupal world, we're so focused on doing where there's a tangible result. Code and programs, functions and classes, something that takes useful input and gives you useful output. A diff or a commit hash that a developer or site builder can look at and point to and say, look what I did. Of course, can't leave out code reviews because needs work is a great way to enable the rest of the duocracy. So, you know, we also have documentation and help and blog posts. These are all items that if I really was kind of crazy and wanted to, I could figure out a way to print and hold in my hand. And as developers and site builders, you know, maybe we don't get project management and our clients don't help either. In many cases, they're coming to us with really tight budgets. Project management just seems like a way to pad our estimates and put another body on the project. After all, I mean, we're all responsible adults. Can't developers manage themselves? We have to communicate with our clients and teach them about the value of project management, about it being as critical to success as functioning code or usable design. We have to teach our clients that when at their best, project managers keep everyone motivated and on track to, keep a, to make a delicious web experience. An experience that our clients get the most value out of and that our end users enjoy. An expert PM makes soup from a lowly ticket, from perseverance, from organization, and a good attitude. Ideally, we forget that they even created the tickets that started the whole process, since we're so enthralled with the final result. They bring the stone to our web soup. The end. Once upon a time, there was an ass who found a lion's skin. Being the great troll of the animal kingdom, the ass amused himself by terrifying all of the foolish animals. Eventually, the ass came to a fox, and the ass started to roar. Of course, the fox listened closely and said, I might have been fooled by you, but your bray gave you away. The lesson? You can wear a disguise, but you can't hide your words. So let's fast forward from the animal kingdom to the Silicon Valley. And once upon a time, but this probably something happened to someone here in the last week, uh, there was a client who was really engaged in a project. In fact, during the initial sprint planning meeting, the client seemed to have a remarkable grasp of the backlog. Uh, the client knew exactly what features needed to be added, what bugs were causing the most pain, even in what order they needed to be done in. On top of that, the client was even familiar with the concept of user stories and used them for all of the action items. The client had such a long list of work, the backlog needed a pager for the pager. It wasn't just a list of what needed to be done, it was a list of what buttons needed pressing, what pages should do what, what forms went where, who had access to them, and even what the URLs should be. Now, you're probably thinking, hold your horses, that's amazing. Clients never know what they want, and it sounds like you have something actually approaching a specification. I love it when that happens. Sometimes we can even do fixed bid, come in under budget, and have a sweet pizza party to reward the team. And I don't blame you. I usually think all of the same things when I see a client who's done their homework. So let's see what happened. The project was started. And let's take a look at the first user story. As a user, browsing with an iPhone, I want to see content most relevant to my location. The first thing I should see when I load the site is a list of all our locations sorted by nearest to me. All right, so the developers here are thinking, well, at least that's possible. There's nothing in there which breaks the web. And, uh, you know, the UX people are thinking, well, 
maybe they've got information to show that that's what their users want, so not too crazy. All right, let's go next. Let's see what's coming up. As a user, I want to be engaged with our brand. And as soon as I first browse the website, I should be asked to sign up for our newsletter. And I should be shown a modal dialog with a 64 pixel high email address field and a large green keep me informed button so I can keep easily engaged. All right, so you know what? That's a little specific. It's actually kind of diving into design decisions and so on. Um, but I can see where a client would get this from. I mean, we've all been to websites on our phone where they don't have a responsive or mobile site, and then you're trying to close that modal dialogue that's up in the way. And you know, maybe it's not a great idea, but at least it's not out of left field. OK, let's continue our user story review here. As a user, I want to share with one click. In fact, I want to share articles and pages from our site on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Google+, all at once. One click. All right, I see you, I see you laughing. Yeah, I, I did a double take too. Like, think about this. You, users really want to be able to do this? Like, let's think about the workflow for this. So they're going to have to authorize the site as an app for each one of those social networks. They're going to have to get approval to post the message. They're going to have to disclose like their real name and their photo and other basic demographic information. Oh, and you know, what was the client's business, by the way? They sell socks. All of these tickets sound like they're considering the needs of end users of the site first. After all, they all started with as a user. And that's someone from the general public using our website. It's got a role for the user in the concept of needs and gratifications and goals. These stories actually have something to do with our website. There's no make Outlook automatically add it to our calendar in these user stories. They're all within the realm of possibility. We could implement them. But there's still a big problem. When it comes down to it, these user stories aren't about the end users. They're about what the site owner wants their users to do. They're top-down statements inserting needs, wants, and goals into their supposed users. The client is treating their end users as programmable robots that can be made to bend to their will. And they know how the company would design it, but from the perspective of their own business needs. The client hasn't truly gone to the real end users and figured out what they want. And that's why, in the vast majority of user stories that you'll read, that clients are actually building and setting up, as a user is a lie. Who knows? Perhaps with their target demographic, their only device is an iPhone. Maybe their target demographic doesn't even have Facebook accounts. And let's face it, perhaps they don't really care about loving the brand and just want to order a new pair of socks. OK, but someone's going to be telling me, isn't it fair that we have business goals and that we implement them? We've all seen sites with annoying user interfaces but often there's good research showing that certain marketing techniques that most of us hate actually work. Well, what's important is that you don't fake the goals of the business by rewording them to sound like the goals of the end user. If marketing wants share buttons on all your pages, that's fine. But they're the end user. They're the user who is asking for that functionality. And you should be writing it assuming that. Because if not, the client or your customer is in the user's skin. If the user in your user stories is your project stakeholder and that they don't actually have the stated goals, if it's some other part of your business who is inserting needs and wants, they're telling lies. And in the end, their words will give them away. And this is really important. Remember not to put yourself in the user's skin either. Because pretty quickly, your words will give you away too. The end. So now we've gone through a couple stories, and uh, I've got a few more up my sleeve to share. Um, so we talked about a couple dis different situations where there's always some kind of constraint on the project, whether it's time or resources or functionality. There's all, you know, constraints are a fact of life. But what happens when you have a project? where there's lots of well-defined goals, and there aren't any real restraints. 
Well, once upon a time, there was a farmer planting a mix of seeds. There were many crows and a single swallow enjoying all of this sudden food. They'd never seen so much food at once. It was all in front of them. They just had to take it. Beware of the farmer, said the swallow. Why, asked the crows. The farmer is planting hemp seeds. They will be our undoing. The crows ignored the swallow and they just ate the delicious seeds instead. And they left the hemp alone. Eventually, the hemp grew and the hemp was turned into rope and the rope was turned into nets. Many birds were caught and they came to hate the nets. Why didn't you listen, said the swallow. Destroy the seeds of evil or they will grow to be your ruin. Once upon a time, but every day, there was a team of developers and they'd all been pulled together to work on a really large project. The team was ready to work through it and get it done. And the developers had a crazy amount of work on their plates, but they also had a really clear direction, which made it really easy to keep motivated. And because if there's something developers like, it's a goal. Because a goal in many ways is a precursor to an algorithm. So the developer team knew that it was going to be hard work, but if they could just get into a rhythm, they'd be able to decompose the goals into tasks, follow the algorithm, and get things done. And the, there were some pretty lofty goals. A dynamic client-side interface that would integrate social network content with the rest of the site. A completely decoupled content repository using the create once publish everywhere philosophy. Multiple client applications and native apps for both editorial staff and the general public. These were goals a developer team could get behind. Goals that would lead to a finished product. You might guess this was going to be a huge project. Huge projects means lots of dedicated time, lots of dedicated people, and hopefully lots of dedicated money. It seemed like they had finally made it to the next level of web project. Now, this project was being run in a fake agile manager, manner, or as the dev team liked to joke, fragile. Uh, they knew they had a site to launch, but they were already on a nine month schedule. And nine months seemed like, you know, a little bit tight, but we could get everything done then. Um, and they had two week sprints and some semblance of a scrum methodology to follow. So the project manager started to file and assign tickets and they had to sort the summaries um, in a really strange way because people started to fight over what tickets they wanted. Like it was one of those projects that people were that excited about. A favorite of one of the backend developers was research and define an authorization API for client applications. Ooh, that sounds like a lot of fun to me. Um, but of course, being a fragile project, uh, they took each sprint as a two week chunk with a TikTok cycle between dev testing and quality assurance. So they get through their first sprint and things come to a, to a close and the QA lead is doing initial tests and uh, preparing to get all of that in place for what needs to be done for the demo. And for the most part, things are actually working pretty well. Uh, the first sprint in this case was set up to uh, do social network integration. Uh, so that meant allowing people to log in to a site commenting system with Facebook and Twitter accounts. And, as expected, Quality Assurance had found some minor bugs. Uh, if you were browsing with IE8 on Windows XP, you could lose your session after two or three page loads. Um, and also, the developers implemented database credential storage such that uh, it was case sensitive, which meant that a Twitter handle for fuzzy kittens123 in all lowercase was stored as a different account than fuzzy kittens123 in all capitals. So, minor bugs, but still bugs. So they were filed by QA, estimated by the dev team, and slotted into the next sprint. Of course, what happens next? It's an iteration, so sprint two kicked off. Uh, the feature set for this iteration was a persistent social toolbar for all pages of the site. After all, you're not a serious website if you don't have a social toolbar. Now, some of the devs started to groan a little. Uh, people actually use these things? I mean. Social toolbars, like, isn't that something we got rid of in the early part of the decade? Weren't they like just like horrible spyware things that, you know, you'd clean out of your family member's computers? But it was a clear goal for the project, at least. And it was going to be a relatively simple set of functionality, and uh, it was a good self-contained component to test out some new tech. 
So two weeks of focus and of work, of asking questions, of writing code, and closing tickets. Yet again, the sprint came to a close, and there was a successful demo. During the uh, Q&A session afterwards, the QA lead asked for an update on some of the bugs from the last sprint. After all, they, they hadn't been fixed yet. Oh, said the dev lead, we didn't get to work on those this sprint. We focused on new functionality. We were really focused on our sprint goal. Unfortunately, as the QA lead started doing more testing, they ran into some interesting edge cases. If you middle clicked on links posted in a Twitter stream, nothing happened. And if too many Facebook updates came in in too short a time, the JavaScript totally bombed and white screened the page under IE8. Sensing the start of a problem, the QA lead said, well, I guess this sprint is done anyways. Hopefully your team can really focus on defects next week and we can keep them under control. What was the next sprint's focus? Writing a Node.js middleware server to act as a proxy between the Drupal content repository and the soon-to-be-built Angular JS clients. Another goal, another algorithm, another clear outcome. The defects continued to grow. Through Sprint 3, through Sprint 9, through Sprint Tornado Man. Yeah, that's right, they'd been through so many sprints, they abandoned numbers and were naming them, naming them after Mega Man boss characters. Finally, they'd spent a year and millions of dollars on the project. And they had a website that actually met every goal that was initially set. And the dev team was really proud of their work. It was fast and it was usable and it looked really good. When it worked, that is. Sure, if you followed the normal 80% pass that users were expecting to take, things worked really well. And of course, things that the dev team found valuable, like full Konami code support, worked perfectly. But if you used an older browser, if you were on a phone that only had 256 megs of memory, if you tried to click the back button at the long time, things broke. And they broke horribly. After all, defects aren't goals. They're blockers to progress. Realizing the defects finally had to be fixed, management pulled in another team at great cost to get the defects under control. It took the new team way longer than anyone would have expected to handle the defect backlog. Because not only were there a ton of issues, but they had grown and tangled with one another. It was so tangled, it seemed like they had a tiny itty bitty machete to fight against the mess. The QA lead reminded everyone of the previous warning. See, we let the defects grow into a jungle, and now we must pay for it. The truth is, just like project managers, we give QA testers a hard time in our industry. We can't just pretend that they do no work. They do work that is tangible. The tickets and the step-by-step -step screenshots and the reproducible steps are all evidence of real work that we can believe in. Uh, and anyone on development or site building teams knows that something real is going on. They can't just put on their blinders. But when it comes down to it, as developers and site builders, we see quality assurance as working in the opposite direction to us. As developers, we close tickets. As testers, they open tickets. Who likes to open tickets? Especially about things that are wrong. How can you live with yourself day after day talking about things that are broken and never actually fixing them? Where do these people come from? Yeah, I know. That's a pretty standard developer response and one you'll have heard before and one you'll hear again. Because as developers, we complete work and as testers, they give us more work. But the truth is, Developers, we like to assume that we are end users, and therefore all end users understand the web. We think of ourselves as users. Testers, they might have what's a more pessimistic, but more realistic view of the users of our products. In the end, they know that real users will be using oddball technologies in oddball steps to complete oddball tasks. And those end users will have perfectly valid reasons for doing so. They know that the end users are right. We can't retrain them. We can only accept them. Testers force us developers and site builders to acknowledge the real world. And that's what bothers us the most. We have to acknowledge reality. 
And reality is scary. Reality gets between us and our goals. It gets in the way and makes all our algorithms dirty and messy and uh, kind of fuzzy. Quality assurance is our shield against the despair of software decay and ruin. They're the harsh blow of truth hacking against our perfect code. When quality assurance raises warnings, we'd best listen to them. To ignore them adds debt and fragility to our products. The end. So we've covered developers and project managers and clients and quality assurance, and there's probably 10 other roles in this audience who I haven't talked about yet. Um, and I know we're getting a little close to the end here, but I think you guys have been a really great audience, and I'm really glad to have you all here. So I think it's time to collect your bonus round. Once upon a time, there was a project. Not just any project. It was intended to be the complete rebuilding of a site. It wasn't just a site rebuild, though. Unfortunately, there had been a server disk failure, and the site was completely gone. There was a quick temporary page up to show something, anything, to visitors. Something to let visitors know that the company was still around. So the client saw this as a blue sky opportunity. So they asked for the sun and the moon and everything in between. Unfortunately, there was an in-house developer at this organization, and they kept saying to all of the requests, that's easy. I could get this done in a day with some HTML and some P CGI Perl scripts that I can download online. The site will be way faster reading our handcrafted HTML than using gobs of memory for a framework like Drupal or Symfony or even that bloated thing called WordPress. Yeah, I know. They said, you know, I've got free time. I bet you $50 I can get the new site done before you even have your fancy CMS installed. Of course, in this case, it was the Drupal developer who was brought in, and they knew it was impossible for them to win the bet. After all, it would probably take them just as much time to define content types and fields and basically do the things that we do to build a site right as it would for this other person to build basic CGI scripts as the other developer wanted to do. Now, if you haven't been paying too much attention and you've been passing around cat photos on IRC or something like that, um, you might have figured out by now that this is a retelling of the tortoise and the hare. We've all heard the lesson, slow and steady wins the race. I could probably tell a fable about insane time-compressed waterfall projects versus slow and steady agile projects. But let's make it a little more interesting. To be honest, I prefer the Mary Melody's interpretation of this fable. There's a great sketch that, of course, gives away the ending with the title, Tortoise Beats Hare. Just like our Drupal developer, the tortoise is forced into a situation where he can't win. He's pushed around by Bugs Bunny into an expensive bet on a race. The tortoise can't just drop out. He's got to race. We've all been in situations like this, and normally it's not an individual bullying us. It's an environment created by a combination of business needs, of client relations, and inaccurate statements of work. So instead of giving up and admitting defeat, our Drupal developer knew that there had to be another option, especially when the real requirements started coming in. So first off, the head of marketing said, we need a responsive theme. Hmm, sounds tough, said the hair or the in-house developer. We have to write a bunch of media queries and choose a CSS framework and pull in lots of glue code to make it work with our custom HTML. The Drupal developer looked at it and said, well, of course, what your actual requirements are will be important, but we can get a basic framework in place once I download and install Adaptive Theme. Most of the hard problems have already been solved by the theme. Oh, and we need to send out newsletters and show them on the site. Easy, said the handcraft everything developer. I'll write up a script to send out emails from a CSV that we export from Excel. Sounds pretty simple to me. Actually, it's even easier, said the Drupal developer. We can use simple news if we actually want something incredibly bare bones, or we can integrate with MailChimp. Either way, our content team and our marketing team won't have to deal with multiple systems on a day-to-day -day basis. This is a solved problem. Oh, and the sysadmin would really like us to pay attention to security so we don't lose our site again. Oh, that's a solved problem, said the Drupal developer. 
Sure, security issues happen, but there's a whole team of people dedicated to watching the code. Uh, and we can even be automatically notified when new site uh, code is available, which improves our site security. Our developer, uh, who did everything in-house, kind of realized how much it would cost to just get someone else to audit all of his code and sort of backed off into the corner and left the project alone. So, you know, let's face it, our Drupal developer has handled these situations pretty well. And why was that? Well, he'd watched a lot of Saturday morning cartoons. He remembered what the tortoise had done to get through his race. Luckily for the tortoise, he lived in an era of rapid technological change. One in particular, Bugs Bunny wasn't prepared for. The tortoise uses the newfangled telephone system and calls up all of his buddies along the race. And he asks them to show up along the road, and Bugs gets super confused because the tortoise keeps getting in front of him, and uh, violence rage ensues, and there's hilarious results. The tortoise wins the bet and shares his profits with everyone who helped him. Our Drupal developer knew that just like the tortoise, what they had to do was figure out a way to change the game. Because they knew that with Drupal, we can change the rules. That when you're in a tough spot, when you're being bullied by a situation, you can make the situation play to your strengths instead of your weaknesses. We too, as a community building software, we can change the rules because we have the internet to connect us. And in the Drupal community, we have a pack of scheming tortoises ready to take whatever it needs to be done to confuse that bunny. Every time we file an issue, we're phoning the team. Every time we upload a patch or write documentation or help someone on IRC, we're helping another tortoise get a little bit further. Together, we can adapt to whatever our clients, our industry, or the internet throws at us. It's this adaptation and resilience that really worries the proprietary CMS vendors. It's what makes free software communities, and Drupal in particular, so successful and so special. And they all lived happily ever after.